Hi, I'm a neuroscientist in the early part of my career. My PhD was in physics. Three years ago, I switched from astrophysics to atmospheric science. My research includes studying the physics of marine stratocumulus clouds and validating satellite data. My goal is to contribute to our knowledge of how clouds are feeding back with global warming. I'm personally very concerned about global warming. Global average surface temps are already one degree Celsius above the background, and I no longer see a plausible pathway for humans to keep warming below two degrees. Based on the IPCC carbon budget, I estimate that to have a two out of three chance of meeting this goal, we need to begin decreasing global emissions by 6% per year starting now in 2016. This clearly is not going to happen. Furthermore, humanity has already procrastinated so much that if we wait until just 2020 to begin ramping down, we need to do so at a rate of 10% per year. This suggests to me that in a world in which we're more concerned about terrorism or maybe even interest rates than global warming, we'll very likely allow warming to go above two degrees. I personally believe that in terms of broad strokes, the science is already settled. We know the earth is warming because of our fossil fuel emissions, and this means we need to stop burning fossil fuels. No additional science is needed to reach this conclusion, and in my opinion, this conclusion is what should drive policy. So in some sense, then, the science is settled. This implies that in terms of doing what I can about global warming, advocacy might be just as important as doing science. But I feel uncomfortable moonlighting as an advocate, as though I'm breaking some taboo of the tribe of climate scientists. So what adv advocacy do I do? Over the last five years, I've come to personally dislike burning fossil fuels, as I believe this harms others. So I've sought ways to avoid burning the stuff in my everyday life. Six years ago, I emitted 23 metric tons of CO2 equivalents per year, slightly more than the US average. And now I emit less than one-tenth that amount. This reduction was very doable. I accomplished it mainly by quitting flying. In 2011, I tallied up my personal emissions for the first time and realized, to my surprise, that three quarters came from flying. And most of this was from attending academic conferences, which is why I'm quite you know, was quite interested in participating in this conference. I made other changes to my daily life that led to other more modest but still quantifiable reductions, such as bike, bicycling, becoming a vegetarian, getting most of my food from the waste stream or from homegrown sources, and aggressive composting of anything organic, which reduces methane from landfill. And um, back there is the, uh, uh, the aggressive compost pile. I actually like these changes. I eat better, I love my bike commute, and I'm more connected with the land, with plants, with food, with community, and so forth. I don't feel like I've made a sacrifice. I think this is an important message. A lifestyle with far less fossil fuel can actually make you happier. So I've also recently started writing to general audiences about this. I believe that scientists and humanists could collaborate more effectively on global warming. In my opinion, scientists already have their core message. Burning fossil fuels has radically changed the Earth system, and we need to stop very rapidly. That's easy to say, but doing it probably requires rethinking our economic system, as well as how we think of ourselves in relation to non-humans. In other words, the climate crisis that is actually asking humanity to rethink its goals, what constitutes a good life. The sciences don't know how to frame an answer to this and to communicate it effectively. Hopefully, the humanities do. Switching from astrophysics to climate science gave me an opportunity to notice similarities and differences in culture. Both groups of scientists value rigor and a separation between personal opinions and evidence-based conclusions. Both groups fly a lot. The average US scientist likely emits more than the overall US average, but I don't have data for this. There's one situation that really struck me when I became a climate scientist. Every few weeks, still today, I find myself sitting and listening to research talks describing some remarkable change or predicted change in the Earth system. The ice melting faster than expected, subsurface oceans absorbing heat, CO2 emissions growing faster than the more pe pessimistic scenarios from a few years ago. The usual scientific cultural mores are in full force during these talks. At the end, we ask a few polite questions, perhaps clarifying some aspect of methodology, and then we shuffle back to our desks to stare at our computer screens and continue with our days. At first, part of me wanted to yell, hey, everyone, don't you think these results are terrifying? But that would be unscientific, and I never did that. This still seems surreal to me. 
I wondered if any of my colleagues share this experience. We don't talk about it. Indeed, there may be taboos in climate science that are specific to climate science. Climate science is asking humanity to give up fossil fuels. When asking the addict to give up his substance, there will be a strong level of resistance. This has unfortunately politicized the subject. When I first joined the field, a colleague warned me not to be an activist. I felt vulnerable having just switched fields, and I took the warning seriously. On the other hand, I couldn't sleep at night if I didn't advocate for change, so I have tension between my need to advocate and my need to keep my job. To begin mapping out the social terrain of climate scientists, I wrote a survey and sent it to my colleagues. So far, I've received 30 responses. The results after 30 responses were not significantly different than the results after 20 respondents. I titled the survey, Being a Human Climate Scientist. The survey explored five categories of questions, basic beliefs, sense of the future, scientists as advocates, personal emissions, and emotions. The survey is biased towards younger scientists since I felt uncomfortable about sending it to senior colleagues. First, I mapped out respondents' belief in the existence of global warming. 100% believe that the planet is warming and that humans are the primary cause. But on average, they believe that only 97% of their colleagues with whom they're personally acquainted also believe this. Two respondents said that 15 and 20% of such colleagues don't believe this. These two respondents were interesting, as we'll see. With a large sample, we could see if there were a discrepancy between how scientists perceive their consensus and what the consensus actually is. I was interested to find that only 60% of these earth scientists consider themselves to be climate scientists. Half of respondents had co-authored one or more peer-reviewed papers directly related to the climate, while over 96 had co-authored papers indirectly related to the climate. The next section of the survey attempted to map out the scientist's sense of the future. When asked, how concerned are you about climate change on a scale from 1 to 5, the mean value was 4.1. Three respondents gave this question a 2 or a 3. We're, we'll refer to them to the less concerned group. Interestingly, this group included the two respondents who said 15 to 20 percent of their personally known colleagues don't believe in anthropogenic warming. However, 90 percent uh, answered this question with a 4 or a 5. 96 percent of respondents believe, like me, that would go over the 2 degrees Celsius threshold. 50 percent are generally pessimistic about climate change, 40 percent are generally neutral, and 10 percent, only 10 percent, are generally optimistic. This surprised me because my colleagues don't seem pessimistic. But we rarely talk about our anxieties with each other. Perhaps this is a taboo subject. I asked respondents to comment on their optimism or pessimism. Several expressed dismay about inertia in social, political, and climate systems. One response that resonated with me was, I waver back and forth. Sometimes I'm quite depressed about it. Other times I'm encouraged that new technologies will still enable us to turn things around. Another respondent, although pessimistic about future climate destruction, stated that it will also be a good thing to trigger changes in our behavior in the future. Another respondent simply said, I have faith in technology. I'm interested in the phenomenon of techno-optimism, but unfortunately I don't have space to explore it here. More than half of respondents believe that life on Earth will be worse for the majority of people in 2100 relative to today. Only 10% believe life will be better. The rest think it will be about the same. One of these was from the less concerned group. 70% believe that the human population has already exceeded the Earth's carrying capacity. I next, next asked, what do you think will be the peak global average surface temperature in degrees Celsius above the 1850 to 1900 average? Note that this question assumes a sort of parabolic trajectory in time temperature space. The mean answer was 4.5 degrees Celsius, and the mean date for this peak was 2090. I then asked respondents how much concern they feel over various climate impacts on a scale from one to five with one being no concern and five being great concern. Here they are in order of increasing concern with the mean score. Warming related economic collapse got a 3.6. Warming related epidemics, 3.9. Increasing extreme heat, 3.9. Sea level rise, 3.9. Warming related agricultural collapse, 3.9. Warming related biodiversity loss, 4.2. Flooding and extreme storms, 4.2. Warming-related civil unrest, 4.3. And drought, 
When asked if humans should engage in large-scale geoengineering, 70% said no, 77% said yes. The next section was about scientist advocates. I gave them, gave respondents a common area to write down what limits the effectiveness of the U.S. response to climate change in their opinion. 60% referred in some form to money and politics. Uh, and then when asked to suggest one U.S. policy for climate action, also in a free form response, 40% suggested a revenue neutral carbon fee or carbon tax, and 30% suggested a focus on renewables. I asked my colleagues, in your opinion, should climate scientists stick to the science, or should they also warn society that change is needed without necessarily suggesting a particular policy? I had them answer on a scale from one, which was just do science, to five, strongly advocate for change. 85% said three or above, 60% said four or five, and 15% said five, strongly advocate for change. This broad support for nonspecific advocacy was a major surprise to me. Four respondents leaned towards just do science, and two of these were from the less concerned group. So those were respondents that gave it a one or a two. Um, similarly, when asked when other climate scientists advocate for change, does this tend to increase or decrease your respect for them? A majority said that this increases respect with a mean value of 3.6, again on the scale from one to five. About 80% believe it's acceptable for a scientist to advocate for a particular policy on his or her own behalf, while 20% believe this is not acceptable. These latter, again, included the less concerned group. However, 80% of respondents agree with my sense that it's risky for a scientist to advocate for a specific policy on his or her own behalf. In comments, several said that it could put funding at risk, and a few said that it diminishes credibility. The next section was about personal emission reductions and the moral implications of burning fossil fuel. 93% of respondents agree with the statement, burning fossil fuels harms other people. Of the two who disagreed with this, one was a member of the less concerned group. When asked, does it bother you personally to burn fossil fuels, 60% said yes, and 30% said sometimes. The vast majority, 95%, think it would be useful for members of the general public to work to gradually but significantly reduce their personal emissions. Nearly as many feel it would be useful for climate scientists as a group to gradually reduce their emissions. I asked two questions about their flying habits. Respondents said they fly an average of 10,000 miles per year, but I think this might be an underestimate. This is just two round trips between LA and New York. A few respondents stated in comments that they'd have liked there to be more questions about individual emissions of scientists, and this was another surprise to me. The final section was about respondents' emotions. I asked how often they feel the following emotions about global warming, panic, despair, and grief, with one being never and five being nearly always. The mean values were for panic, 2.0, to spare 2.7, and for grief, 2.8. Nearly all respondents feel frustration about society's lack of response to climate change, and this question received a mean score of 4.1. I often feel that my job is surreal, so I took a risk and asked, do you ever feel that it's surreal to be a scientist studying the changing Earth system? To my surprise, half of respondents gave this a four or a five, with a quarter saying nearly always. 100% of respondents were interested in seeing the results of the survey. Can we draw any conclusions from all of this? Certainly the vast majority of our scientists are very concerned about climate change. Also, I was surprised by how much interest these scientists have in reducing their personal emissions. They're hungry for alternatives. Most of them, like me, feel that burning fossil fuels is wrong. Maybe we're closer to a cultural shift where burning fossil fuels is no longer considered socially acceptable than I thought. Scientists who feel less concerned might be more likely to claim that larger fractions of their personally acquainted colleagues don't believe in anthropogenic warming. They are also more likely to disapprove of scientists' advocates. However, there is apparently overall strong support for scientists' advocates within the earth science community, at least among younger members of the community. Finally, earth scientists... Um, finally, earth scientists have emotional responses to their work, with the majority agreeing that it's surreal to witness the earth changing within the restrained culture of professional science. It might be interesting to do a larger and more careful study. The respondents are suggesting some interesting additional questions on the survey. So is it okay for scientists to be advocates? Surprisingly little has been written about this question. In 2013, the climate scientist Tamsin Edwards wrote a piece in The Guardian entitled 
climate scientists must not advocate particular policies. She wrote, I believe advocacy by climate scientists has damaged trust in the sciences. We risk our credibility, our reputation for objectivity, or if we are not absolutely neutral. Before this survey, I was anxious about this. Now I'm starting to think that this loss of credibility would be greatest among those who, for whatever reason, don't want humanity to take action on climate change. I'm willing to lose credibility with this group. Many scientists fear losing funding if they speak out. I don't know whether or not this fear is justified, but I'm willing to take the risk. I'd go one step further and suggest that not only is it okay for climate scientists to speak out, but that we have a responsibility to do so. No other group of humans has a better sense of the danger global warming poses to humanity. We're in the position of knowing a danger much more clearly than most people, and I think it's immoral not to point this out. I would be great, it would be great if the science spoke for itself merely through our peer-reviewed papers, but apparently this is not the case. Climate science is quite different from astrophysics in this regard. And of course, climate change is driven by human society, economics, and politics. It seems very natural to me, therefore, that climate scientists would want to make a connection between changes to the Earth system and drivers in our human systems. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to continuing the discussion.